Good afternoon. It is my great pleasure to welcome you in, to our in-person and virtual program, Five Laterals and a Trombone, The Play 40 Years On, hosted and organized by the Stanford Historical Society. I'm Julia Hartung from the Office of Development and a very enthusiastic and longtime member of the program committee for the Historical Society, whose goal is to bring you these illuminating windows into Stanford's history. Perhaps most relevant for today's program, I am a proud member of the Stanford class of 1982, graduating with a degree in history a few months before the fateful November day that would become the play. I would like to extend a special thanks to our Stanford Historical Society members who are with us both in person and online as your support makes our programs, oral histories, and other important historical resources possible. As our members know, the Society is an independent, volunteer-driven organization devoted to the scholarship and sharing of Stanford history. And we rely heavily on membership dues and donations to keep our work going and put on events like today's. If you aren't already a member and you're not hearing the little plug in this message, please think about joining, which you can do on our website, historicalsociety.stanford.edu. And now, as Shakespeare so beautifully said, the play's the thing. It was in the spring that my, I know I thought that was good too. It, <laughs> <laughs> it was in the spring that my classmate Tyler Bridges contacted me to see if by chance there might be an opportunity to talk about his new book at our upcoming 40th reunion. After my fellow program committee member, John Gifford, and I spoke to Tyler, we immediately imagined what a great program this would be for the Historical Society. While the catalyst of this program is Tyler's book, it was John's idea to turn this into a full program and recruit the rest of the panel. So thank you, John, for all your hard work on this. <laughs> to kick things off, it's my pleasure now to turn things over to our MC, Gary Pomerantz. Gary is a New York Times bestselling author and journalist who has written six nonfiction books about history, race, and sports, and taught for the past 15 years in the graduate program in journalism at Stanford. A 1982 Cal graduate, also in history, Gary served as the sports editor of the Daily Californian in 1980, two years before the play. His sixth and latest nonfiction book, The Last Pass, is a New York Times bestselling narrative about race, regret, and encroaching mortality as an old man comes to terms with his life. It tells the poignant story of the relationship between Bob Cousy and Bill Russell, iconic Hall of Famers of the legendary Boston, Boston Celtics dynasty that won an unprecedented 11 NBA championships in the 13 seasons between 1957 and 1969. Sounds like such a great book. We are lucky to have Gary with his ties to both Cal and Stanford as our moderator for today's discussion. And I'm delighted to welcome to the stage now, Gary. All right, let me put my cards on the table from the get-go. My wife and I are Cal alums. And once, once in a prehistoric time, even farther back than 40 years, I was the sports editor of the Daily Cal. For the past 15 years, as you heard, I have been lecturing here in Stanford's graduate program in journalism. And during that time, I've had a few Stanford football players in my class, Richard Sherman and Kobe Fleener among them. And when they were on the field, I rooted hard for them, even when they played against Cal, my students first always. Now, my wife was born at Stanford Hospital. Her parents and two of her grandparents are Stanford grads. One of her other grandparents went to Cal. Her great-grandmother went to Cal in 1905. We have three kids. 
our daughter is a Stanford alum. One son is an alum of Cal's Haas Business School. And our other son is an alum of Stanford's Graduate School in Business. All of which makes me your moderator. <laughs> now, I did not attend that game on November 20th, 1982. I was 3,000 miles away working as a young sports writer for the Washington Post. But my soon-to-be wife was there at Memorial Stadium. She thought Cal had lost after Stanford kicked that field goal with four seconds left, and she was hugging her friends, boo-hooing of another Cal loss. As her back was turned to the field, the most remarkable finish in NCAA history football played out, and she missed it. She never saw it. But two and a half years later, I married her anyway. So there, all my cards are on the table. In November of 1983, upon the first anniversary of that memorable fin finish, my old friend Ron Fimright of Sports Illustrated wrote, and here I quote, it is now called simply the play. There is no need for further explanation because there has never been anything in the history of college football to equal it for sheer madness. Now, as Fimright wrote, replays of the play were shown at halftime in the following weeks in NFL games and NCAA games, usually to the musical accompaniment of the William Tell Overture. <laughs> to have heard the Cal broadcaster on radio, Joe Starkey, make his hysterical call of the play, you might have thought either that Janis Joplin had returned to the Fillmore or that the Hindenburg had crashed again. I mean, how crazy was it when the game ended, the most celebrated Stanford guy was not the star quarterback, John Elway. This was his last college game. It was a trombone player in the band, Gary Terrell, who I'm very, very happy to say is here today. He's got some pictures growing up through the years. <laughs> Where's my third grade picture? <laughs> okay. And so here we are, not, not merely just another big game week, but the 40th anniversary of the play. We've got a lot to discuss. As a scene center, I'd like you to turn your attention, and we're going to try to get everyone in the right frame of mind, and perhaps some in a foul mood with this video, please. I'd like to ask Tyler Bridges to join me on stage, wherever you're coming from, Tyler. There he is, come on over this way. You all missed something, not getting to see what I saw, because Tyler comes in on the side. Looking at, at Rod and Ahmad and Gary looking at this. Ahmad's just going like this. Rod's going like this. <laughs> um, welcome home. Thank you. Can we start with something? Of course. Uh, how many people are Stanford, Stanford people? <laughs> All right, that's most of you. How many are Cal? Oh, we got some Cal people in the house. Okay, next question. How many people were at the 1982 big game? Wow. Okay, final question. How many of you were on the field? <laughs> How many of you were carrying a trombone? <laughs> well, um, as I say, welcome home. Let me do this introduction properly. Tyler Bridges, Stanford class of 1982 and a trombonist in the Stanford marching band is now a New York, uh, excuse me, New Orleans based journalist who reports on Louisiana politics for the Baton Rouge New Orleans Advocate. He's written five books, including one entitled The Flight, about his father's heroic service in World War II. His dad, a Stanford alum, Dick Bridges, survived a German attack on his B-24 by parachuting out of his exploding aircraft in about 60 years later or so, in uh, 2003, after Dick Bridges had passed away. Uh, Tyler pieced together his father's remarkable story. Um, apart from his writing, Tyler has been both a Neiman Fellow 
and a Shorenstein fellow, a center fellow at Harvard and a distinguished fellow in residence at the Annenberg Public Policy Center at Penn. We're gonna engage in a, in a question and answer uh, about his newest book, uh, Five Laterals and a Trombone. Um, it's important to note and to celebrate that Tyler's daughter, Luciana, is uh, a sophomore, right, at Stanford, and Sitting she right is in the there. audience today. <laughs> We're glad you're here. Tyler, your book is a fun read, and it's, it's faithfully told. It brings the reader back in time um, and presents disparate viewpoints, and I congratulate you on your thoroughness. Uh, you're a political reporter in New Orleans. Until this project, you'd never done a, a book about sports. You'd never written about sports. What prompted you to write this book? Right, um, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. Great to be here. Um, so I grew up in Palo Alto, um, not too far from Stanford and, and uh, went to Stanford football games um, as a kid. Uh, two of my sisters are here and we used to walk to games with my dad and sit in the family area of the end zone. So I grew up as a Stanford fan and then I was, you know, I went to Stanford and I played in the Stanford band and, and, and then graduated in June of 82. And I was not there that day. I was in Washington, DC, <laughs> like you were that day. And um, I think what happened that day resonated with me because I had been a Stanford fan. I went to Stanford, I played in the band. I knew most of the people on the band uh, who were on the field. Uh, I had watched the football team. And, and from time to time, I had this thought, you know, maybe, you know, maybe I should write a book on it. But I kept thinking that some sports writer like you, in fact, I remember hearing your name, thinking, oh, my God, Gary Pomerantz might write that book. Oh, well, I guess I won't do it. But you didn't and nobody else did. <laughs> so what were some of your biggest research and writing challenges in this book? Yeah, so I started off this book, um, the play lasts 21 seconds, right? So how do you write a book out of something that lasts only 21 seconds? And I ended up deciding to, that, that there are a lot of stories have been written about the play and they were always looking at the play in retrospect. Um, there had been one great story had been written by, uh, about the play and it was the one that you referenced by Ron Fimrai. He wrote a year after the play and, and he wrote, it was almost, I sort of thought of this as almost sort of like, um, the pilot version, you know, when they do a TV series, like this was the pilot version for me, his account of the play. And I ended up thinking that um, those of you who have gray hair, um, you'll remember the old TV show Columbo? Of course. Right, so Columbo, the, the, the opening scene, you, you find out who did it, right? And yet you wanna keep watching the show because you wanna figure out how it gets figured out by, Peter Falk playing Columbo, right? So in the same way, anybody who picks up the book, I was thinking, is gonna know who won the game. But if the details are so interesting and the anecdotes are so great, then, then people will wanna keep turning the page to find out what happens next. So I ended, I ended up interviewing 375 people. And uh, like I went over to Green Library and I started copying articles from the San Jose Mercury and the San Francisco Chronicle from 1982. I ended up copying 1,500 articles from nine different Bay Area newspapers on the 1982 season for Stanford and Cal. And it was very different because when you and I do a newspaper story interview, we're, we're uh, like, what happened? We're looking for a good quote, right? When I was working on this book, I didn't want good quotes. I wanted great memories, great little anecdotes, telling anecdotes. So all the questions were very different than when you and I do uh, a newspaper story. It was like, where were you? Who was else was in the room? Like, paint a picture for me of what the locker room looked like. Or when I talked to Ahmad Anderson, you know, tell me about your background. Uh, when I interviewed uh, Rod Gilmore, a key play that he made in the game, that uh, what was going through your mind at that moment? And he tells me this little stuff. So I'm allowed, I, I can put the reader on the field at that key third down play where, where Rod Gilmore is, or Gary, Teller, Gary Terrell, I think tells a great story about how he joined the Stanford band. Um, and I love the story that, that, that I'd never seen before about Gary. Okay, what did you do after the game was over? And how did you find out that you had become famous? So I have these little, little anecdotes like this that I was searching for that I pulled together in the book. As of this moment, 
How many times have you seen the play? Too many. <laughs> and Stanford never wins. <laughs> so I, it's sort of like the, the, the Kennedy Zapruder film, you know? I have studied that, that play. You know, I would watch it and I'd, I'd try to look at, at individual players to see exactly their movements on it so I could be able to describe it and figure out, um, you know, and, and there's little details I think are really interesting that uh, like members of the Stanford Axe, they ran out onto the field. Uh, I have a story in the book about a, a guy in the Stanford band who ran out on the field and thought he was gonna be expelled because he wore a cone on his head and thought he was too noticeable. So yeah, I, I, just all these great little funny details. And then everybody, just about anybody there that day has a good funny little story. So you interviewed 21 of the 22 players on the field for the play. I mean, you went the distance and beyond. You vacuum cleaned this subject. You interviewed someone who was, correct me if I'm wrong, at the time he was a 14 year old water boy for Cal. You even interviewed the Cal maintenance worker whose job was to remove the padding from the goalpost after the game. What were you after in interviewing those two people? Right, um, the, the water boy, um, uh, Steve Oldenburg is his name. Uh, it turned out his dad was a team dentist. And um, just, you know, everybody who was there has a little thing that they see. You know, the, the stars, you have to interview the stars, but often it's the people who are lesser known, who are kind of close to the action that have a really good story to tell. Um, yeah, but the, the I, I like this. I, I, again, watching the, the 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 video of the play, the Zapruder like, and there's two different, basically two different versions of it. Um, and one of the versions that clearly, uh, I was interested to see what happened to the ball. Kevin Moen scores the touchdown, but what happened to the ball? And I was thinking about you know these stories, these very famous sports plays in this country. You know, Bobby Thompson hits the the home run in 1951. Well, who? What happened to the ball? Or when Roger Maris hit his 61st home run in 1961 for the Yankees? What happened to the ball? So I was very curious to find out. Well, what happened to the to the winning touchdown? And so it was this this uh, Cal Stadium maintenance worker who fell on the ball. And so I had to find him. And so I include his story in the book too. As a student, you were a member of the Stanford band. You knew some of the band members, many of them, who marched onto the Memorial Stadium field that day. They didn't march. <laughs> <laughs> when, as a former band member, when you watched it, speaking specifically of the band now, what did you think? You know, there's regret in certain ways. You know, it's the most famous moment of the Stanford band history, but it's also the most infamous moment too, right? Um, so yeah, I think it would have been great to be there. I, I will say one thing. Um, I'm glad that I was not the trombone player. In fact, the, the, the best trombone player was the guy who was knocked over Gary because he turns out to be a great ambassador for Stanford and a great ambassador for the Stanford band. And he's been adopted by Cal. <laughs> he's probably never had to buy a drink at Berkeley. <laughs> Today's event is sponsored by the Stanford Historical Society. So let's talk for a moment about your research process. Now, years ago, I too wrote a book about a sporting event that happened 40 years before. Will Chamberlain's 100 point game uh, against the New York Knicks in 1962. And Chamberlain had died already by the time I started to conduct my research and um, did a few hundred interviews, people who were at the game in Hershey. There was no video footage of the game, only a fourth quarter call on WCAU radio in Philadelphia. I found out that 40 years later, there were some conflicting memories, 40 years being a long time. So my question for you is, did you find conflicting memories as well? And if so, what were those conflicts and how did you reconcile them? Right, so um, I interviewed the five surviving referees from that day. Six of them were on the field and the seventh one was an alternate. And when I interviewed him, um, he was started, you know, after the, after the touchdown was scored, you know, the referees huddled there on about the 30 yard line to figure out was it really a touchdown or not. And this guy started telling me what was going on in that huddle. And then I looked at the video, well, he wasn't in the huddle. 
<laughs> and, and, and I, you know, memory can play tricks, you know, decades later. But um, yeah, when you get conflicting accounts, and I've, I've had this happen with other books, and you've had, you know, you've had the same thing happen, you just try to figure out uh, whose version really sounds accurate. Uh, and you try to find people who will corroborate that account. Um, you know, it, this is not math. This is not two plus two. You're writing about something and you're getting the best version, that most accurate version you can get. But, you know, you don't, you know, you're not trying, you, you know, you can't be 100% accurate in everything. You really just do the best you can. So you and I have talked a little bit about this, but deeper meaning, you know, in the play. Um, is there a deeper meaning in the play? Well, if there is, it escapes me. <laughs> um, you know, you've read books where they take an event and they talk about how what it, what it means about the times or whatever. Um, I couldn't figure out how to write that book. I, I will note the interesting thing about the, the game was, you know, it, the video you've seen, that was not shown live. The game was not shown live in, in the Bay Area or anywhere. And all we had live was the radio account. So there was no instant replay at that time either. Um, and meanwhile, just you know, right within the vicinity of this campus, you had you know, Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak. They were making changes in the technology and, and, and Bob Noyce at Intel and all these people were making all these sorts of changes that have changed the technology. So one of the reasons the play could never happen again is because of all these advances in technology where every, you know, everything is televised, you have all these different camera angles, you got instant replay. So that's, that's the closest I can come to sort of saying that uh, what the deeper meaning, but you know, you've written lots about sports and I haven't, but there's something about human that we like to read about sports and watch sports and the human condition and what causes somebody to make that tackle or, or to throw that pass. Um, I, you know, those are, I think those are kind of fascinating stuff. So if it did happen today with all the changes that you refer to in technology, social media, cell phone cameras, somebody could be on the field, right? With a cell phone camera that catches right. your, becomes your Zapruder film for the moment. Um, instant replays, what, how might it have played out? Imagine it today, it happens today, what, what happens? Well, I guess the referee would have gotten underneath the little hood and the camera. And, and you know, I think one of the great things about the play is just the craziness of it all. And, and people, if you were there, and so many of you were, and probably people watching via uh, uh, the live stream, that people didn't know who had won the game. It was just such bedlam. Um, Joe Cap, the, the Cal coach, he runs off the field he doesn't know who scored the winning touchdown. And I just think that adds to the sort of mystique and lore and craziness of, of what happened that day. You attended Stanford, your dad attended Stanford, your daughter now attends Stanford. While writing this book, did you have partisan feelings? Um, he was down. No, <laughs> <laughs> no um, <laughs> I'll take that as a yes. No, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a professional journalist in Louisiana. I cover politics and, and I might be talking one minute with a, a ardent Democrat and then the next minute with someone who's an ardent Republican and maybe they hate each other. And I have to be able to talk to both sides and hear each side fa uh, fairly. So I actually didn't really have a difficult time separating all this out. I just thought in, there's a, in the end that there's a great entertaining story to be told that day. And that was my driving uh, driving thinking was just, hey, great, get great anecdotes. And when somebody would tell me a great anecdote, I, well, I know that's going in the book. So was Dwight Garner's knee down? So that's the key question, was, was Dwight Garner's knee down? So um, I think we have a special guest here, right? I think we do. We have a special guest who can answer that question better than I can. Um, let me introduce, um, let me just start off by saying his name and then we ask him some questions. Jack Langley, are you in the house? Here. All right, so, so your name is Jack Langley, right? That's correct. Were, were you at the 1982 big game? I was there. And where were you? I uh, well, was, let me say, where were you? Were, were, you on the, on, were you in the stands? I was on the field. I was the headlinesman on that game. 
The headlinesman. The headlinesman. Where were you on the climactic moment to determine well, whether Dwayne Garner was when down? when you were showing this film up here, and I think I've seen it about 15 or 20 times before I got down here, I was the probably the closest official to the particular play where the guy went down. Or and if you saw the, the video there, there was actually, there was three guys. And let me just say this about the officiating aspect. Every official that was on that game is a seasoned official. We all had a probably 10 games in the conference prior to that game. We got a telephone call a couple of weeks prior to the game, assigning us to the Cal Stanford game. And being a resident, actually the only resident of the Bay Area that was on the game, I live in Belmont. I'm not in the phone book, so don't look in there for my name and call. Me. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, on that particular play, well, let me just, I, I had a couple of notes here, if you don't mind, let me just say that. First of all, I wanna thank Tyler and John for inviting oh, me yeah, here. Yeah, this yeah. is really a hoot, I really enjoy myself. The game officials, as I mentioned, how were seasoned. Um, the, uh, hang tight, I'll get there soon. Well, let me just say this. The other thing I wanted to mention is Tyler in his book is very, very accurate with all the things that happened. Where I was in the game, I was probably three feet, probably, let's say, 12 o'clock from the runner. The way went, was it Dwight Gardner? Uh, three feet from him. If you notice, there was probably a, an official about 10 o'clock, and there was another official probably about 8 o'clock. I'm three feet, the other guy's about seven feet, the other guy's about 10 feet. And we all had a pretty good vision coming in. Neither one of us blew the whistle. And my particular answer to that question today, was he down? I don't know. We're all taught to make a positive decision on what we see. And the positive decision by all three of us, we did not see a knee down. And if you did look at the video, you will see five, four or five Husky Stanford players surrounding this guy. And I was there and all I saw was a ball come out. I will tell you the truth. I had a breath in my lungs about ready to blow that whistle when I saw the ball. So anyway, I don't know if he was sound or not. <laughs> <laughs> So right. thank you, Jack. That's not the answer Stanford wanted, but uh, <laughs> um, I think we're going to go on to something else. Um, but I want just you know I inter again I interviewed 375 people. One of the one of the things I do in the book is tell the story uh, of the pageantry and the uh, and and all the sort of craziness that goes on in this, these rivalries. Uh, but David Selatniel was the last guy. Will you stand up, David? He is, this is the last guy who stole the ax. <laughs> stole it for Stanford in 1973. He and uh, Tim- He's Conley, been on the lamb ever since. He's right? been on the lamb ever since then. Yeah, he stole the lax uh, from, from some unsuspecting Cal students at Ming's restaurant in Palo Alto in 1973. And I tell his story in the book. All right, we're gonna hear, the rest of the program will run like this. We're gonna bring up our panelists. I would like to ask our panelists who have their own views about what happened in the play to please come up on stage. Um, Tyler will take us through a, a brief slideshow. Then we're gonna engage in a Q and A with our panelists. By the way, at the end of this at six o'clock, Tyler will sign books out front for you. All right, so um, I'll, I'm just do a little bit of narration. Um, the photograph to the left, I think, is really interesting because the Stanford football team actually entered the field from the stands, which I don't know. I don't ever seen that before. Uh, Cal has a traditional entry through the um, uh, there. Here is a, a game time program. Um, you probably recognize this guy, John Elway. He was up for the Heisman Trophy that year. Oh, <laughs> how'd that get in there? <laughs> how'd that get in there? <laughs> that was obviously some Cal fans who put that, to put that together. All right, so these are the two Stanford students, two of the three who were locked to the ax that day. 
uh, because Stanford was in possession of the ax from having won the um, big game the year before. Uh, here's Vincent White, who uh, scored a couple touchdowns that day with Elway, celebrating. This is the final kick by Mark Harmon. You saw it in the video. Um, here's a sideline picture of Harmon making the kick that will cause Stanford to take the lead, 20 to 19, celebration. Elway celebrating, Stanford players celebrating, running onto the field, 15 yard penalty. <laughs> Here's the kickoff, and we'll stop there. Uh, this is a really interesting photograph taken by um, a Stanford student in the, in the, in the uh, stands. You can see up in the left-hand corner um, that, the, that you can see the ball that Kevin Moen is just about to receive the final lateral. And if you see in the middle of the field, you'll see a couple of um, people wearing white and, and uh, red shirts. That's the Stanford ax on about the 18 yard line. <laughs> And the most famous photograph was taken by a guy who's wearing a blue jacket, light jacket, and a baseball cap down and kind of in the middle left. He was standing in the end zone, and Gary Terrell is right, right, right there too. And here's another one um, uh, picture. Here's another picture taken by, uh, from the stands. Can you imagine if somebody told you this guy was about to score a touchdown but he, he was going to have to run through all the Stanford band to do it. You go, what? But he did. And this, was, this captures the moment again when Kevin Mullen got the final lateral. And there was only one thing that separated him and the goal line. And that was the Stanford band. The, 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 the circle up in the right is kind of interesting because that's Jack Langley. Um, <laughs> and people from Stanford have often said, oh, there was a referee blowing the whistle dead. But Jack, I asked him why he had his arms out to the side. And he said he was just trying to tell himself to stay calm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Stanford's kicked the winning field goal. There's Paul Wigan, the Stanford coach. Now, now what's going on? What's going on now? Uh-oh, I think the game's over. What's going on? See the score there, it's still 20 to 19. The refs are trying to figure out what's going on. They're huddled there in the 30 yard line. Well, there's uh, Jack Langley's the one with his mouth open. <laughs> <laughs> Scores tills 20 to 19. They still haven't figured it out whether it's a touchdown or not. It's still meeting. And here's uh, Charles Moffat. He's about to raise his arms and signal that indeed it was a touchdown. Here's Mark Harmon who's jawing, jawing with him. Right next to him, there's Rod Gilmore jawing with officials. <laughs> And here is the, uh, this is a few seconds later. Here's John Elway walking off the field, his last collegiate game. Uh, here's Paul Wigan. Here's Mass Bedlam on the on Memorial Stadium. More Mass Bedlam, Cal now has the ax. Here's a little interesting story that I tell Paul Wigan uh, after the game, immediately after the game, he goes into the television truck uh, where they had uh, recorded the game and he wanted to watch the video of what, it, what had happened to see for himself uh, to try to determine that the refs had blown the call. Um, and then Paul Wigan will then go to the refs locker room and try to get them to overturn the result. And Jack Langley and the other refs are in there and um, Paul Wigan does not succeed. I, and I tell that story as well, but here's Wigan coming out of the truck convinced that the refs had blown the call. Here is Joe Cap celebrating the victory for Cal uh, after the game. There's all the sorts of admirers down below. So um, I think that's the slideshow. All right. Allow me to introduce our panelists. Rod, if you would raise your hand. Rod Gilmore, Stanford class of 1982. <laughs> a defensive back on the Stanford football team and also a member of Stanford's baseball team. Rod later earned a law degree at Cal, proof that he doesn't hold big game grudges. <laughs> he is currently with the business law firm of Doty Barlow, Britt and Tiemann in Palo Alto. Rod joined ESPN as a college football analyst 26 years ago uh, and works on an ESPN ABC Saturday telecast every week through the season 
and contributes to studio shows, including College Football Live and Sports Center. Welcome, Rod. Ahmad Anderson, Cal class of 1983. A defensive back on the Bears football team, Ahmad was inducted earlier this year into the Cal Athletic Hall of Fame. Ahmad has more than two decades of experience with an expertise in human resources. He's led diversity and inclusion initiatives, developed organizational strategies at Fortune 500 companies, nonprofits, an educational organization. He is the creator, 1982, of the chant Bear Territory. Note his shirt he's wearing under that jacket. <clears throat> A chant that the Cal football team after victory still performs. Gary Terrell, raise your hand, Gary. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Stanford class of 1983, studied industrial engineering and had a long career in accounting. Wait, how come he's got a fan club? <laughs> <laughs> There's a, probably a good answer to that. Um, suffice to say, he is the most famous trombone player in the history of Stanford's marching band. <laughs> Gary currently serves as CFO for tobekind.com, a company that provides plant-based oils, lotions, and soaps for revitalization and pain management. And here's a fun fact. Gary has attended more than 100 Grateful Dead concerts. <laughs> Fellow writer, Adam Burns. Adam, raise your hand at the far end there. I'm really glad he's here. Stanford class of 1984, Adam moved to Los Angeles after his Stanford years and earned both a law degree and an MBA from UCLA. He has started and funded entertainment and tech ventures during his career and currently develops real estate. Okay, Tyler, you know these guys, take it away. Yeah, and before I do that, I wanna recognize one more person if I could. So I was in the Stanford band, so was Gary. The Stanford band that, that we got to, we were a part of would not have existed but for a guy who was there involved uh, in the, really the creation of the modern Stanford band, I wanna recognize Art Barnes, who is sitting back over here. Um, and before, before I get the questions, one other guy I want to recognize, um, we in the, you know, the Stanford band developed its, its own shows Monday night. Um, it was, the meetings were called Smut. Um, and typically the thinking was, well, if the show isn't any good, how will say, say, save the day? That's how Michelson, who was the band announcer who's sitting in the back, how Michelson. All right, so um, let, let me begin with Rod, I guess. Um, can, can this be the last year? Yeah, <laughs> I was gonna ask you, how, 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 do you, how do you feel about talking about uh, the 1982 big game? Uh, I don't talk about it that often. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I, I guess, you know, I, I've gotten over it a long time ago, maybe a couple weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that big a deal anymore. <laughs> no, but I mean, what people forget is that in a span of four seconds or 21 seconds, you went from the thrill of victory to the agony of defeat. And it happened like that. So, um, you know, it kind of stays with you. But in the big picture, as you, you know, get some perspective on things, that play, that game was great for college football. It was great for the rivalry. Um, you know, and I, I, I feel for my Cal fans, I mean, at least they have something that they can hang on to. <laughs> <laughs> Generations of Cal fans don't know the thrill of a Rose Bowl. So 63 years and counting, so you can have the play. We're good with that. 
<laughs> so you don't really like talking about the 1982 big game. Ahmad Anderson, how do you feel to, like uh, about the 1982 big game? I, look, I, um, for me, I walked onto that team. Uh, I walked on and then six months later, I became a starter. Um, and then through that process, I became one of the defensive captains. And so I was a local guy from Richmond, California, who just went from BART train to BART train station. So for me, that was, Cal football was my, my professional career. That was it, five, nine and a half, 175 pounds, which I wish I weighed now today. Um, <laughs> but I, I tell you, it just was breathtaking. You know, that, that victory and the agony of defeat, as soon as that field goal was kicked, it was devastating. Um, it was one of the, forget us playing, forget us being there. It was one of the greatest college football games I've ever seen in my life. Regardless how that ended, the, the laterals, it still was one of the greatest college football games of my life. And, and uh, I, it's something I never forget because, you know, the Bear territory, uh, having the defensive captain, living, then going to work at Berkeley and being there, being an academic advisor for student athletes, um, being involved in politics in the Bay Area. Somebody, my job, somebody always says, aren't you that guy? <laughs> <laughs> and so there it is. But, you know, um, I'll say this, my son went to Stanford. Um, and so one of the greatest times that I've ever had is the dorm he was in and I went up to the dorm and I see his guys in the, in the dorm and they're in sort of in that fourplex, two rooms in the center, right? And I said, hey guys, how you doing? They're like, hey, Mr. Anderson. I'm like, what's, I said, dude, what's wrong with your guys? Well, we were playing Madden and they made me be Cal because they said your dad went to Cal and it was Cal versus Stanford and we won. And I never told them until after the game that that guy named Anderson, that's my dad. He was part of the big play and defensive captain. Mm -hmm. So that's how I feel about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Ahmad, I, I, saw, I saw your, I'm gonna call it tepid performance of Bear Territory on the ESPN documentary. Oh, I wonder if you might do it right here. Oh man. Right, do it right here, the real version. So I do this respectfully because I am in this house, um, <laughs> but it is what it is, right? So here we go. So the, the initial beginning start of it was just a kind of a, a jazz beat. I was in an Afro jazz from Africa to uh, uh, America jazz class. And you had to listen to music and name the artist for the test. So despite what people think about athletes not really studying, I had to study for that particular class. <laughs> So the band, which I love the band, the band and, and the football teams have a great relationship. I just did the Bear Territory on campus a couple of weeks ago, uh, brought tears to my eyes because that was the rallying cry for us as athletes. When you hear your band, when they travel with you, it, 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 sometimes you're very lonely on the road, but that brings heart to it. So I had gone through this cheer, been trying to listen to some beats. And so because I was in the jazz class, it went, You know it, you tell the story, you tell the whole damn world, this is bear territory. Well, if any of you know, my, my name is Ahmad Jamal Anderson. Ahmad Jamal was one of the great jazz pianists. And so that came easy to me. But when I got to that field and I was saying that the jazz, I taught it to the players, the band came in and you know, the drums start kicking in and it goes, you know it, you tell a story. You tell the whole damn world, this is bear territory. Now, <laughs> the offensive, offensive linemen, I was a DB, so we always had a little rhythm or whatever we did. But offensive linemen and defensive line, they're kind of, so <laughs> I said, just look, you know, cause they were going this way, we were going this way. So just say, what? So you know it, what? You tell the story. What? You tell the whole damn world, this is bear territory. And bear territory, and I think it goes for this school and any other school, is when you apply to have the courage to, to, to apply to Stanford, I want to go there. 
I want to go to Cal. When you apply, you wait, you get in, and on the back of my T-shirt, and this goes for anybody at a school like Cal and Stanford, it's grinding every day, doing what it takes to get through the school. It's the unity and camaraderie of being students and being proud of that. And as a football player, there's that teamwork. And the teamwork it takes when you get in that stadium and that coliseum for your entire university to be behind you 100%, that leads to success. And that's guts. Whether you're at Stanford, whether you're at Cal, it's all about guts as academics to the sports field, as university alumni of our great universities. All right. So Gary, one simple question. What the hell were you doing on the field? <laughs> That's the first time I've been asked that. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought it was Gare territory. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, were, we, were, <laughs> we, we were down there uh, getting ready for our post-game concert. So we, it was proper to be at field level, pretty tight there at the south end of the, of the field behind the end zone. And, um, you know, we, we scored the, the winning field goal. Broke into all right now. Drums just wailing the whole time. You can, you can hear them, you know, in the, the replay of the kick return, you can hear the band in the, you know, in the background. Um, and I think once the, once the clock hit zero and uh, a lot of my bandmates uh, took to the field, there was sort of this pressure release from the congestion. And I found that I had backed myself into the end zone. And um, then um, I, I met Kevin. It was, um, <laughs> it, it, it was, it was brief and kind of awkward. <laughs> We've become friends since then. Yes. And, and you didn't, you didn't, it was one of those meetings where you didn't really know his name at first, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah. You didn't even know what it hit you, right? Oh, I, I, I saw him right before he hit me, so I knew what hit me. <laughs> Speed dating. Can you describe what it felt like to get hit by Kevin Moan at that moment? You know, I can't. <laughs> I, I don't, I, I remember being knocked down, you know. And I, I got up pretty quickly, I think. I just sort of, you know, shook myself off. Um, but it, it didn't hurt physically, just ego and pride. <laughs> So Adam Burns, um, you were at the game, right? Uh, yes, I was in the press box, actually. Okay, so you see Stanford lose the game, and, and I think you said you, 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 were, you're, you weren't feeling too good, right? Yeah, I mean, when you're in the press box, you aren't supposed to um, root or anything like that. But yeah, I was, I was rooting everything else. And uh, yeah, so, and then we actually tried to go into the Stanford locker room afterwards, and they had closed it completely. So I did get to go in the Cal locker room and I saw columnist Glenn Dickey high-fiving it with Joe Cap and everything else. But, and I was just really. <laughs> so the game was on a Saturday. Um, your Stanford lost the game because of the referees, right? Sorry, Joe. Those referees. <laughs> so, um, so, the, so there's a tradition at Stanford, um, Sunday night flicks at Memorial Auditorium. And, and the people who know it, how may, may make aper, paper airplanes go up on the, the balcony, which I never could figure out, and they sail their little paper airplanes down to the, uh, to, to the stage area. But you were, the night, uh, they, you were there that night, and what, what was going through your mind? And take us forward, if you would, Adam. Yeah, so what actually happened was, um, you know, I'm sitting there at the Sunday Flex, and I kept ruminating back to the fact in the Stanford Daily offices, there was a picture of a prank that Stanford had done in the early 1970s when Chuck Muncie um, was at Cal. And it came out prior to the big game. And it said that Chuck Muncie had been disqualified from the game. And I thought, oh my God, that was the funniest thing. Um, and I kept thinking, well, one day, maybe we'll do a fake paper at some point, but never happened. Um, and nobody really ever does a fake paper after a game. And, and I'm thinking, you know what? let's do a fake paper saying that the NCAA had given the big game back to Stanford, make it look exactly like the Berkeley paper and see what happened. So that's essentially how it started. And, 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 and uh, the, the, you, you guys produced this what day? Yeah, so what actually happened is I went into the Stanford Daily offices the following Monday, um, talked to the editor in chief and business manager, gave him my whole plan. Um, 
they liked it, but they were a little worried about the legal, even though we're an independent paper. Um, and in fact, we have uh, Hal Michelson to actually thank because they apparently called Hal because he was on the board of the paper and a lawyer and said, are we gonna get, in, get into any trouble for this? And he apparently said, you can ask him, but he apparently said, no, go, go ahead and do it. Um, so, um, so my friend Mark Ziegler and I wrote pretty much the whole paper. There was one article that had been written by a, by a fellow who, who, who had been working with the Stanford Daily, but Mark and I pretty much stayed up all night, um, did a you know, 24 straight hours uh, writing so that we had it, we had it into the printer um, relatively early on Tuesday. Um, and by that point, we had somebody scout out all the locations on the Berkeley campus where the drop boxes were. So we had maps of where every drop box was. At that point, we finally let other people in. So we had a group of about 12 people that went over to Berkeley at about uh, 5.30 or 6 a.m. in the morning. We had you know, somewhere about seven to 10,000 papers that we dropped off in all the Berkeley drop boxes. And then we got unbelievably lucky. Everybody thinks we somehow sabotaged the Berkeley paper because they were eight hours late that day. But it turns out they were doing a special double Thanksgiving issue and they had printing problems and we were the only paper on the campus. So, <laughs> so luck was part of it. Take, take that, Cal, huh? Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. So, so Adam, last week I called Bill Coombs. Bill was a sports editor of the Daily Cal. He was on the staff when I had been sports editor. He's on the faculty at the University of Washington now. I said, Bill, what was your take on that newspaper, the fake newspaper? And if you hold it up, the name across the top, the story is Bill Coons, and it's misspelled. All the names are misspelled by one letter. Yep. He said, well, <laughs> I was walking in Sproul Plaza, and I went to the Daily Cal Rack, and I pulled this paper out, and I see my name on a story I know I didn't write. <laughs> and I know how to spell my name. And I said, so what did you do then? He said, well, I was heading to class. I said, did you go? He said, no, I ran to the Daily Cal. And, and we were all talking about it. He said, you know, I've thought about it a lot through the years. And he said, you know, we would never have thought of that at the Daily Cal because we wouldn't have had the money to print the extra special edition. <laughs> I said, but as you look back on the idea, Bill, what do you think? He said, Brilliant, <laughs> brilliant. Now I happen to think newspapers are sacred, but it was pretty good, <laughs> pretty good. Um, so the most famous player in that game was John Elway, the Stanford quarterback uh, who goes on to be the first pick of the Denver Broncos and then a Hall of Fame career. Um, Rod, you, you, you were his teammate and you went up against him in practice. Uh, tell us a little bit uh, about John Elway and what he was like Unbelievable. <clears throat> Greatest um, football player I've ever seen in my life. And, you know, I played against Marcus Allen and Charles White and all those guys. Um, but he was unbelievable. I I'll tell you how good he was. You know, Stanford had this tradition and history of quarterbacks having to wait three, four years before they got their chance to play. And um, when John came up um, in the summer uh, for our seven on seven workouts, um, you know, we hadn't seen him in person. We heard about him mm -hmm. and the like. And um, we go through seven on seven. He's throwing the ball. And we go, I think he might play. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, that's, right. Yeah, it looks like he might play. And um, true story, um, <clears throat> first day of practice in pads, John is like the number six quarterback on the depth chart. Uh, when he gets his rep, he throws the ball. Boom. Breaks the finger of one of our receivers. <laughs> a few plays later, another rip, boom, breaks finger of another receiver. The next day, our number two, three, two and three quarterbacks transfer. Wow. <laughs> John becomes the number two quarterback. And for four years, we could not recruit a quarterback because nobody wanted to come and sit behind John Elway. So everything you've heard about how hard he threw the football, and that if you tried to catch it with your chest and it would leave across the points of the football, true stories. 
um, I had to think twice and practice about actually wanting to knock a ball down that he threw because I kept thinking I'd break a finger. Um, but he was just unbelievable, um, incredibly talented, very competitive. Uh, whether we played backgammon or <laughs> baseball, he was the most competitive person um, and as great a teammate as you could want. He wasn't, he wasn't a prima donna. John had this car, uh, a beat up Datsun B-52. Something B like B-210. B-210. Yeah. And I, I think every player on the team had a key to it. <laughs> and if we wanted to go off campus, we just, John, need the car. It's like, all right, go. So that's, that's, um, that's how good a teammate he was. Now, once he signed with the Yankees uh, and he bought the sports car, right, right, right. not everybody had a key. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Uh, Elway signed uh, a pro contract with the New York Yankees after um, in his junior season. Um, and he had just, uh, I tell the story in the book that Stanford had just played San Jose State and San Jose State was coached by his dad um, and Stanford lost that game. So uh, Ahmad, just th there's one of the things that's really interesting in history is if somebody makes a decision, history goes one way, right? Or if they don't, things would go another way. If Jack Langley blows that whistle, the play doesn't happen. We're not here today, right? But also, if you watch the video, um, Stanford's last big gain was a pitch to Mike Dodderer, which was a play that completely confused the Cal defense. And you heard Joe Starkey yell, Dodderer could go all the way, but Ahmad and his teammate Richard Rogers tackled him. Uh, what happens if Mike Dodderer had cut outside of you instead of to the inside? If he had scored a touchdown, the game would have been over. There would have been, the, wouldn't the play wouldn't have happened. Uh, what would have happened if Mike Daughter had cut outside? Well, first I'm gonna, I'm gonna validate what uh, Rod said about um, the quarterback throwing so hard. One thing is Richard Rogers made a statement in the recent ESPN that he threw so hard uh, that uh, Emil, he, he didn't have any choice but to catch it because it was like a dart that stuck him. But this finger here, has a knot on it because I deflected a ball in the game and that happened. This is a real story. Richard Rogers, who played, who's one of the coaches for commanders will tell you that story himself. So that's true. Um, I, I'd say to you he, that if he had gone outside, he, if the pitch comes, um, I am taking on the, the wide receiver, the wide receiver, uh, gets me and I start sliding. I've been a little damp that day, but whatever, he takes me down. And I'm scrambling to get up to my feet. And I see him sort of hips, just eyes are still focused on him. He turns inside. But I never would have been able to reach over the wide receiver from the outside. You know how it is. <laughs> from the outside with the man on you. And so when he cut inside, I just barely held on for dear life, just enough for Richard to come over the top. Um, the interesting piece for me, I never thought about that part ever until, again, my son watched the game and said, Dad, had you missed that tackle, you and Uncle Richard, the game's over. Forget let about me, the play. Let me ask you about this, though. Yeah. Fourth and 17. Oh, man, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, the, the play before that, um, we had just stopped. And I go across the field and you know, you see that now you see it a million times, right? And everything comes back and you're like, what? And I'm like, yeah, I'm jumping up and down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, I just, just, just never, deflated. never been a greater throw. Never. In college never. football than that fourth down throw. He's, and, he's great. And let me, let me tell you, we felt going into that game, you know, we had a bowl game on the line. Yes. Um, and we felt like we had John Elway's Heisman on the line. Yeah. Now, this was not the times of internet and whatnot. So, you know, we win that game. John Elway's brought us back, game-winning field goal. That throw, Boom. fourth and 17, under his own goalpost, is the highlight that plays across the country. Yeah. And instead of Herschel Walker winning the Rose Bowl, I mean, winning the Heisman, Heisman, John Elway wins the Heisman. Absolutely. You know, but Absolutely. I'm just saying. For you to be on the field when you saw that, that ball, it, it took a half a second to go from the eight yard line to the 40 yard line. Yeah. And, and you think about it because we as defensive backs, 
you know, you see it and it is zip. For us, our hearts are pounding. I'm thinking this guy is John Elway. I know that. That's Superman back there. I know that. And he scrambles. I know he can lift it like nobody else's business. He can do it. And all of a sudden, and I'm on the far right-hand side. I'm away from all of that. And I see the, now I'm, I'm watching the game. I'm watching. <laughs> and I see that ball and Jimmy Stewart, Clement Williams, Freddie Williams, they have him draped. That ball comes through like grandma need, knit, knitting. Boom. I was outdone. I just, I already knew there, if you're mine, it'd have to be a miracle that they didn't score. What we didn't expect when Dotto got the pitch was them to pitch the ball. We thought for sure it was going to be a pass. Uh, we just thought for sure it would be a pass. So, yeah, good call. We're, we're going to turn to the audience in a moment, but I want to put a question to all four panelists. <clears throat> that is, what does the play mean in your life? What, is, what does it come to represent? And maybe we'll start at the far end with you, Adam. Got it. Um, well, you know, looking back on it now, I mean, it's just one of those really fun little things that like everybody brings up and wants to talk about. And, um, you know, you asked a question earlier about the play and looking back on it, unlike the football players, I didn't have the same vested interest in it. Um, but as a fan, I was obviously bummed when it all happened. But man, it really elevates this game above every other without the play as great as the last John Elway drive, 40 years later, we wouldn't have a panel talking about it. So, um, so to uh, me, it's one of those great things. I think it's a great part of the whole rivalry and it really elevates the rivalry. Gary, any question? Uh, boy, it, uh, it turned out to be an inflection point in my life. It, I was in <laughs> denial about that for a, for a while. I thought, you know, not that big a deal. But you know, once the phone started ringing and started getting all that attention, and pretty awkward to start out, but um, I sort of warmed up to it and, and was able to make a lot, a lot of friends along the way that I that I really cherish. Um, so it, it, as much of a bummer as it was to lose the game, some some pretty good things came out of it for me. But you've just handled it through the decades with incredible grace and humor. Yep. And you have come to represent every man. You know, people, people have a harder time identifying with a football player, their great physical skills. But yeah, trombone, the guy got flattened. That's me. Thank you anyway. Yes. Yep. Thank you. I, I'd say for me, um, you know, I used to be, yeah, I was a kid, right? It was Ohio, Michigan. Texas games, Oklahoma, Nebraska, all that stuff. That's what I saw. My family's from Boston. So it was, it was Harvard and Columbia, you know, those kind of things. So I just thought to myself that um, we're on the map and we will be on the map forever. I can't wait till this time of the season every year to see Cal and Stanford. I mean, I'd go to the games regardless, but that we are on television. And we are, as I said in a recent documentary, it's the Bay in the Bay against the Bay. And that's special to me. I'm a California raised guy and love the Bay Area. So it's really special to me in that way. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, well, having been in that locker room, you know, there, there, were a, there were about 100 guys and, you know, 15 coaches and staff members. And, you know, that day, um, for a lot of seniors, that was the last time that they ever played a game of football. And that thrill of victory and agony of defeat is the, 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 the last thing in their sporting lives, you know. Um, so... From that perspective, that was that was a hard day, hard night, it's a hard week, you know, and the like. Um, and then I went to law school at Berkeley. Mm. And for those of you who don't know the proximity, the law school <laughs> is right across the street from Memorial Stadium. <laughs> so law school is bad enough 
<laughs> and every day I had to keep looking at that stadium. <laughs> um, the impact of it and the impact on my life has been far reaching. Um, I remember um, interviewing at a law firm mm. in my second year of law school and um, I'm talking to a lawyer and he's looking at my resume and he goes, you play football at Stanford? And I said, yeah, 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 yeah. He said, you know, I remember watching some crazy Stanford game. I think they were playing Cal a couple years ago or something. You, you weren't on that team, were you? Yeah, I was on that team. <laughs> Seriously, you were on that team? Yeah, hang on a second. He gets on the phone and so next thing I know, three other lawyers come in the room. <laughs> so you were on the field with this play? Tell us about it. Do you know John Elway? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm, okay, great, let's get through this great at least. So that, that whole thing, uh, and that was not in the Bay Area, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> And it just impressed upon me that it was making its way around the country. And having been at ESPN for 26 years or whatever it's been now, um, you know, I hear about all the time. And every year or five years, there's a documentary or something about it. Um, I was pranked during one studio show about it. Um, so, all that's happened, but but for me, my my bottom line on it is simply that you you can't you can't argue that it's the most iconic play mm -hmm. in the history of college football. That's right. And people try to talk about the Flutie play against um, you know Miami, but you know there's there's nothing like it. It's been incredible for this rivalry, and it's been great for college football yep. because I mean it had. Everything you would want in that game, you're right, it was one of the greatest games ever. Absolutely, sir. And then you had all the nuttiness <laughs> at the end, and you had human error. Jack, I'm sorry. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> it was down. <laughs> there was a fourth lateral that was missed, all that. But you know, you know, and maybe we made a mistake when we called the timeout, but there was human error in it as well. So everything that you could look at and say, you know, you, you wanted a novel, you wanted a movie was in this game. And I think that's why people are drawn to it because, you know, it's just not your cut and dry, simple game. It, it has so much more to do with it. And I think it's been great for sports and great for college football and just incredibly great for this rivalry. How about a round of applause for the panelists? We're gonna open it up now to audience questions. As you'll see, there's two microphones, one on either side. I would ask if you're interested in asking a question that you come to one of the two microphones. Um, while you're walk walking over in that direction, we had some pre-submitted questions um, from online. And one of the interesting ones, and I don't know how to answer this, said, how much is a used ticket stub to that infamous oh, game worth? <laughs> I have mine. Gary? I, I uh, when we were doing the, uh, the recent ESPN documentary, uh, Jeremy Schapp was, you know, asked, you know, he asked, you know, would you ever think about selling your trombone? And I said, no. He said, you know, it could be, it could be worth seven figures. No. Um, but he called one of his memorabilia guys and asked, asked about game tickets as well as the, the trombone and verified good condition ticket uh, recently had been sold for 1500 bucks. Trombone was five figures. <laughs> the trombone, by the way, is in the College Football Hall of Fame. Am I right? In, in Atlanta. Yes, that's right. Please. Hi. Uh, my name is Mark Borowski. I'm a uh, class of uh, 1981. So I had two years of Bill Walsh and two years of John Elway. I was really blessed. And I was at the game. I came back from medical school and uh, sat in the end zone where the uh, where the final you know play happened, and I had no idea what was happening until you know until the instant replay. Um, but it, it certainly was an iconic game, uh, and I, I'm sorry if I kind of went off to a bathroom break uh, when you might have discussed this. But why why did uh, Paul Wigan not run the clock down to uh, mm. um, look like two seconds or three seconds before he kicked the field goal? I know it was only second down, so that might have entered into his thinking. And uh, I would add one more thing. Um, 
I also went to Cal. I grew up in in Berk in in Oakland, so I was uh, you know I was both a Cal and a Stanford fan growing up, and then I went to UCLA. So I'm in agreement with the late Cal uh, announcer Lee Grosscup that the common enemy is USC. USC. Thank you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Rod, I'm going to let you take a stab at that, and then maybe Tyler, you take a stab. I think Tyler is the better person to answer that question about, you know, Wiggins' decision, because I know that he now says he regrets calling the timeout that early. Can you explain what happened exactly? The sequence? <sighs> really? Not yeah. why it happened, but, but the sequence of what happened. Well, um, my daughter had just run the football back towards the middle of the field. And John was looking to the sideline, you know, for instruction and calling timeout. And I don't know who was looking at the clock, but the, but the call came in from the sideline, from Paul Wigan, I believe, you know, to call the timeout. And John did that, called the timeout. Um, and Mark Harmon had been practicing his kicks. And so as far as I was concerned, and I can't speak for everybody else, but when I saw the eight seconds and I saw Mark, I thought, we're golden. He'll make it. He's a great kicker. Whatever time is left, you know, there'll be, you know, a scrub kick or they'll grab the ball and throw a Hail Mary, but won't be a problem. But um, I, I did see, I, I never talked to Paul personally after that game about why the, <coughs> all the time out then. And for me, it, it didn't matter that much now, but he says he regrets having called it at eight seconds. So I think the theory is you call timeout with eight seconds because maybe there's a penalty because if there is a penalty on the final play of the game on the offense, the game is over, or maybe there's a fumble or something and there's a bad snap. So it gives you a little more, it gives you one last chance. Um, so when I interviewed Paul Wigan, one of the questions I had was it you who called the timeout with eight seconds or was it John Elway? And, and Paul said he could not remember when I asked John Elway, you know, was that your call or was the coach? He said, I don't, I don't remember and I'm glad I can't remember. <laughs> Jack, here's a question for you, actually. Um, it, it says, uh, do the referees from that game ever cross paths? You ever see other referees from that game? I mean, would you have, would you socially? Well, obviously or otherwise? after the game, yes. Uh, probably think... not after the game. The following season, we have worked together in other games, yes. Did you talk about the play? Uh, we knew about it. <laughs> <laughs> I will say one thing, though, uh, very quickly. I, uh, Gordy Reese, who was the line judge, uh, came to a meeting, and I saw a couple of Cal players that had the play T-shirt on there. Wherever they were, there they are back there. And <laughs> Gordy wore his shirt to that particular meeting. Oh, and, wow, uh, wow, he wow. covered it up quite quickly, you know, so. <laughs> wow. A question for Ahmad. Oh. Um, Joe Cap was a very colorful coach. What was it like to play for him? Yeah, so the first time I ever met Joe Cap was after the Garden State Bowl in 1979. And we had lost in, against Temple. And somebody said, hey, Joe Cap is up in the suite. Go on up there, you'll meet Joe Cap. I was like, yeah, okay. And I'd met him once before, but just in passing over the years that I'd been there. And I, oh, the, my freshman year, that was my freshman year. And so I go up and the first introduction to Joe is, Joe says, go, in, uh, go into the bathroom there, go into the bathroom. And I walk in, it's a sauna type size pool tub that had all the alcohol you could ever think of in life. <laughs> So I go, okay, thanks, no. And so I, I didn't do that, but I went to Studio 54 that night. <laughs> so, you know, I was like, years later, um, before that season, Roger Theater gets fired. Mm -hmm. And um, we go to Freddie Williams and I interview in the trivia and we say, you know, we, we want theater to stay. Um, it's come finally to fruition where we're gonna hit it. Regardless who the coach is, we're gonna go seven and four. So Joe Cap shows up and he is just like a ball of fire. 
Um, I think they showed Mayfield uh, for uh, uh, the Panthers. He was headbutting all the players the other day on television with his cap on. Uh, Joe Cap would get out there and try to tackle you. Bam! With just you know, he'd have his he wore his Letterman jacket to practice. He'd be trying to hit you. He was he was a fullback playing quarterback, and he was that kind of coach that was this, as he said, the bear quits, the bear never dies, and he just that's all he stood for. Now was Joe a great coach? He became a better coach, but it was his his disciples, if you will, that made the difference in the game. The Gunther Cunninghams, the uh, Al Saunders, the Ron Lins, all these people went on to be head coaches or the coordinators. That was that was what it was, specifically Ron Lin, who yeah. coached here at Stanford. Yeah. There you go. We have one last question, <clears throat> maybe two last questions. Hello, thanks. Uh, it's Alan Crystal, and I was class of '84, and uh, definitely in the stands, and felt that thrill of victory, and then this terrible agony of defeat. Yeah. Uh, so I remember it well, and uh, I, you know, one thing, I, the thing I've been thinking about as you all have been talking is how great the game was, this game, this play, and how great college football was. And I, I can't help but have a little bit of a feeling like football's not the same today. You know, college football's not quite the same. It's become more of a business, and we got the Pac-10 splitting up, and uh, players can make money and, and I'm talking to my kids. I'm always saying it was better, you know, back in the day and everything was great back in the day. I just wonder, um, how you all feel about the current game. Let me also say that, just sorry, before I, uh, finish just that I'm also friends with Adam from uh, class of 84. And I, it was definitely very satisfying to have your edition come out. So even though we lost the game, it just felt good to to get that one last, uh, that yeah. last lick in. But uh, so thank you for doing that. And yeah, I just would, you know, if any of you wanted to just comment on the game today and maybe how we could get back some of the, the spirit uh, that, that it was. <laughs> Gary? Well, I, you know, I, because all, every game is on TV now, mm -hmm. the games are so long so many interruptions of continuity so you can, you know, buy a truck or, you know, whatever. Um, that, I think that has, has ruined some of the entertainment value of it. I have so much respect for these, these young men who play, who play the game and are really, you know, risking their health doing it. Um, and I, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll continue to go to games and, and have a good time, mainly tailgating. You know, that's, that hasn't changed much. Right. Um, but uh, it, the the spirit is a little different now. It is, as you said, more like a business. It's it's vastly different because you know, colleges. I mean, there's a long history of this, but athletic departments and universities decided that you know they wanted the athletic departments to be self sustaining, mm -hmm. and to do that, they had to generate their own money, and then they made um, you know a deal with the devil. I mean, with television. <clears throat> Um, and so we have more games, yep. and to make things work, um, TV needs, you know, more content, more ad time, and our games now, I think, average somewhere around three hours and 20 minutes or somewhere around there. Um, so we've got a three and a half hour window to get a game in. But I think, you know, if, if you want to really point to something else that's changed besides the business aspect of it and the television side of it. You know, we have eliminated the regionalism of college football and we've made it national and we've promoted and pushed, you know, 14 playoff, a 16 playoff, 12 team playoff. And so while the country gets wrapped up in who are the four best teams, halfway through the season, half the country checks out because their region and their teams are not involved. We have out west here, we've got a great race for the Rose Bowl in the Pac-12 this weekend. There's still five teams fighting for two spots in the championship game, but that that won't be the main story in college football. Mm -hmm. You know, it'll still be about you know who are the four ranked teams and the fifth and sixth place team. And look, and we at ESPN are we as we're as guilty about this as anyone. But to me, um, the Rose Bowl matters. You know, and those regional games matter. Yep. And um, we, we've lost a little bit of that when we've gone national 
And when we decided to make this into a business as much as we have we done over the last 20, 25 years. Okay. Last question. My question has to do with the play itself. How was it spontaneous that day? The call of the play? Also, how much did Cal practice <laughs> that play before the event? So to say it was spontaneous means it was never done before, right? So we watched the team last night on Philadelphia try to be try to reenact that and see what happens there. It is something that we did every Sunday as a practice, warm up, break down, relax. I don't care what it was. They would line us all kickers, you know, the water boy, whatever, in your sweats. And you just were, you go down the line, you, you call, you know, one through three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and you break up in threes. The ball was thrown in, in, in uh, from one end to the other, like, you know, like a kickoff and you got it and you just started passing it around, passing it around. You know, the other piece where we had, you know, Cal rugby team is phenomenal, it's been phenomenal. We had several rugby players playing on the team. I mean, we had maybe 10 rugby players on the team. So if we didn't ever, if we never played, we always watched them. And so every, whenever they got on the football field, they were always throwing a rugby ball, you know, like they were doing rugby. So that was what it was. That, it came, it came naturally. The key that was in what took place was Richard Rogers, uh, the year I graduated, I was the um, most inspirational. Richard was the most inspirational for the next two years after I left. Richard Rogers told them in the huddle, do not go down with the ball. Do not go down. That is what he said. And that's what happened. So who won the game? Okay. So who won the game? 2019. 2019. 2019. Um, Bear territory all day, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Tyler will be signing books outside. You can purchase books out there. You can also, if you think later, I wish I bought more books, tylerbridges.com. One more round of applause for our panel and thank you for coming. So on behalf of the Stanford Historical Society, I want to thank our panelists for Gary and, and Tyler and, and the whole crowd and thank you, our audience. Um, sorry we couldn't um, bring in the 600 who registered um, to be online, but it's delighted to have so many in the room and thank you for all your great questions. Um, again, to our members, thank you for your continued support that makes these amazing programs possible. I hope you will think about about joining. Um, I can't guarantee that they're always going to be this entertaining, but they are always rich in Stanford's history. So a um, so couple of programs I wanted to call out uh, coming up, Exposing Moybridge, which is a film screening and discussion. We also have Voices from the Hennessy Presidency, um, which should be great, a new book that's coming out, and a program on academic freedom and Stanford, the Ross case and beyond. Um, you can find all of this information and more about our, the oral histories that have been done, past programs and the video recordings of those on our website, historicalsociety.stanford.edu. Yeah.